Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Across the Sea of Galilee was the area called the Decapolis because there are 10 cities across on the other side. And guess who lived on those 10 cities? In the mind of the Israelites, it was the pagans. That's where they always live, right? They always live on the other side. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Vines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me Today. Today. Today with Jeff Vines. Hi, my name is Bill, and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. Today's message from Pastor Jeff is looking at the other side. Many towns have the other side of the tracks, or a north south divide, or some kind of other side division. Well, in the book of Mark, we hear about Jesus and his disciples as they venture to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And we see that Jesus came to reach all people, not only those on the right side. Let's hear from Pastor Jeff and see what this passage of Scripture has to teach us. I mean, Mark chapter four, a very powerful narrative. And the reason, the reason I like going back to these narratives is because we learn so much about Jesus by reading the stories written about him. As a matter of fact, you've heard me say numerous times, the reason Jesus came into the world was twofold. Number one, to reveal to us what God is like. The whole purpose of Jesus coming to planet earth was so that you and I could know what is God really like. What is God really like? So Jesus told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, look at my life. And so when you see his compassion and his love and his care, then you know, wow, this is what God is really like. And the second reason is because he came to redeem us. Because we're all sinners. Everybody in this room, right? Everybody backstage, everybody on stage. We're all sinners. Nobody's better than anybody else. And we see Jesus' compassion for all people. Now stick with me. I'm in Mark chapter four, verse one. Here's how the story begins. And Jesus starts to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and set it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore on the water's edge. So here's what's going on. The scene is almost unimaginable. The crowd is so large that Jesus has to step away from the shore into a boat. And so he preaches from the boat. The boat is kind of like his platform. From the disciples' standpoint, by the time we get to Mark 4, Jesus is having a very successful ministry. He's gaining popularity. Ticket sales are out the roof. The crowds are growing. It's bigger and bigger. There's food challenges. He's got to feed everybody. And this Jesus movement that starts to gain momentum As soon as it does, Jesus kind of drops a bomb and he looks over to the disciples in Mark chapter one, verse 35. And it says, he said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now the other side is a technical term in Jesus day. It's not just the other side of the lake. It's not merely a command of geography. Across the sea of Galilee was the area called the Decapolis. It's the Greek word from which we get our word decade. It means 10 because there are 10 cities across on the other side. And guess who lived on those 10 cities? In the mind of the Israelites, it was the pagans. That's where they always live, right? They always live on the other side. In fact, over there, there are seven nations that according to the book of Acts chapter 13, verse 19, These are the people that God kicked out of the land, the promised land, the land of Canaan, so that the Israelites could take possession. But it's not like they were really good people and God did an unjust thing. Theirs were the pagan temples and the cultic practices that reveled in sexuality and violence and wealth. Not only that, but the Decapolis on the other side where Jesus wants to visit is where the Roman authorities are, the oppressors of God's people in this day and time. As a matter of fact, would you like to know, do you know what they worshiped on the other side? They worshiped pigs. True story, we know that. Antiquity tells us. Now, what animal was regarded the most unclean among the Israelites? 
pig. And the Decapolis on the other side, pigs are worship. It gets worse. Over on the other side in the Decapolis, there are Roman soldiers. As a matter of fact, there are a legion of soldiers. These are the soldiers that detested the people of God. They wanted them D-E-A-D, dead. Guess what the symbol for the legion of soldiers on the other side was? A pig's head. So naturally, in the Jewish mind and the disciples, when Jesus says, let's go to the other side, in their mind, the other side is Satan's side. It's where those people live. It's where there's evil and dark and and demonic. It's a place where God is not. It's a place where a rabbi would never want to go. And yet this rabbi says casually, let's go to the other side. Right at the height of his ministry, the other side of the tracks. The disciples are probably thinking, does Jesus even know who's on the other side? But they go. Now, if you know the story and you're following, when Jesus and the other disciples get to the other side, there are no crowds, no welcoming party, no parade, just one guy. Just one crazy eye, messed up guy. And every time I read this passage, I remember the movie, Mr. Deeds. Remember the crazy eyes? And the Bible says in verse three, when Jesus got out of the boat, they're on the other side now, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind them anymore, not even with a chain. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So the reception committee is a man with an evil spirit. And of course, this isn't going to surprise the disciples because after all, they're on the other side. They tend to generalize when you talk about people on the other side. They're all demon possessed. Sure, this is what's going to happen. This is what these people are like. But if you read the story, you discover that this guy's in such bad shape that they try to chain him up, bind him so he won't hurt himself or others. Because the Bible's going to tell us later that he actually howls at the moon every night and tries to cut himself with rocks. So this guy... (laughs) He's on the other side, and even the people on the other side have rejected him. And he's at the very bottom of the spiritual barrel. In fact, the Bible says he's in such bondage that no one or no thing was strong enough to subdue him. Evil had such a hold on him, he was captive to his own soul. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this guy to get to this point. It could be that he had some kind of an addiction that scared out the sacred. Everything that righteous and good is gone, and now he's been possessed or overwhelmed. It could be that somebody broke his heart. And created a wound that just kept growing that he couldn't recover from. Maybe he's made some bad choices in his life. And that's opened the door to demonic activity. And finally, possession. The Bible very seldom tells us why. And I think it does that because it wants you to know that there are no worse sinners than anybody else. We're all sinners. Some of the decisions we make have deeper ramifications. But the reality is, we never know. We all know there are things we can do and say and believe in our lives that would open the door to some kind of demonic influence or possession that would take us down a road that's hard to recover from. What we do know is in this story, when the demons saw Jesus, they were terrified. They always are. And so whatever it is in your life or mine, whatever it is that's overwhelming us, that's possessed us, no matter what is it that's taken over us, an addiction, a habit, a hurt, a hang up, bitterness, an unwillingness to forgive, uh, the type of personality that always sees the negative in everything, has a hard time expressing gratitude, thanksgiving, whatever it is, when it meets Jesus, it's always terrified because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now stay with me just quickly. I was walking out the back door. I came on Monday. It was a holiday and I'll usually come in and work on a holiday because it's very quiet around here. I can get a lot of good study done when nobody else is around. But it was Monday night and Celebrate Recovery still meets. I love those guys. They meet all the time. And I was walking by the back door and a guy came running out of the kitchen. And you could tell he wanted to celebrate. He said, Pastor Jeff. And I had no idea who he was. He said, Pastor Jeff, look. I said, look at what? He goes, I've been sober four years. And he had this bracelet on his ankle. And I didn't know why it was there. And I didn't really want to ask. He said, but it comes off in a few weeks. I'm thinking, wow. And this guy came out. He wanted me to celebrate with him. Pastor Jeff, this church has saved me. What he really meant is Jesus has saved me. I met a savior. I had this oppression inside me and something happened. One day Jesus happened to me and now look, I've been sober four years and these are all my friends and I volunteer my time and I cook and I clean. I do all, I found Jesus and he's made a difference in my life. And the Bible says that when the demons met Jesus, that they spoke in a loud voice. I'm in verse seven. What do you want with me? Jesus, son, the most high God. In God's name, don't torture me, the demon says. Verse 9, Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. 
and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. And then something interesting happens if you're following along. The demons make a request. They say, please send us into the pigs. And Jesus says, okay, go. And 2,000 pigs ran over a cliff into a lake and drowned. Now, you and I read this story in animal rights movement. This would have been very different to an Israelite than it is to you and me. When we think of pigs, we think of cute little animals like Porky Pig. So it seems a bit sad to us that Porky and his 1,999 little friends ran over a cliff and died. But the people's response in Jesus' day when the pigs ran over, look at what he says. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this into the town and countryside. You bet your bacon they did because they're pig herders. And when you come home and your boss asks you what happened to the pigs, you're going to have to say something. Well, there was this mass suicide. And verse 14 says, and the people went out to see what had happened. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. That's verse 14 through 17. So notice they don't respond. Jesus, you've got great power. Could you come and heal my mother? Could you come and heal my tormented child? Can you come and repair my marriage? Can you get rid of these demons in my life? Instead, they come to Jesus. What do they do? They beg him to get out of town. Why do they do that? You say, what's bad for pig business? But I think more likely it's because they know he's from the other side. And the other side has no real concern for this side. The people from Jesus' side come over to the other side, the Decapolis, and all they do is judge and ridicule them. The trouble with the other side is they also tend to generalize about people from that side. They think everybody on that side is judgmental. They've never met a guy like Jesus before. So they're thinking, please get out of here because you really don't love us. You're not here about our concern. You've just come with a sense of superiority and judgmentalism like everybody else. So the town gathers together when they hear what happened and they go down to the river and they tell Jesus or go down to the lake and say, Jesus, please leave. And they beg him to leave and he does. Now, when he gets into the boat to leave, look at verse 18, Mark chapter five. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. Now get this picture. The man is healed. Everything's fine now. And he looks at Jesus and I can see him getting down on his knees. Please, Jesus, take me with you. Don't leave me here. This place has destroyed me. Let me come with you. Let me be with you. I'm willing to leave everything, everything I have. Please, Jesus, please. And he begs and he pleads and he cries. Please let me get in the boat and go to the other side with you. And that's how we know this is a genuine conversion, right? Because when you genuinely are converted to Christ, you don't use him as some kind of loophole to get out of hell free card. You understand what he's done and how he's transformed you and you desire to be with him all the time. That's how you know you've truly been converted and changed. You want to be with Jesus. And so the demon possessed man, please take me with you. But Jesus says, no. Look at verse 19. Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Now imagine what the demon possessed man is feeling as the boat is pushing away from shore and they're leaving him behind. I imagine Jesus smiling and saying, go on now. I know you want to come with me. There'll be a time, but go tell your story. Go on now. Go, go tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. I need you here. I know you want to come now, but stay here. And maybe the demon possessed dude gets a look of determination and a definitive resolve. And he says, you know what? I'll do it. I'll do it. You saved me. I'm a changed man. I'll do it. Nothing will stop me, Jesus. I'm going to bring light to the other side. Now, just quickly, why did Jesus do that? Why did he leave him? Because life transformation is the most convincing empirical evidence to the power and the love of Jesus Christ. I've said before, I love apologetics, but I've never brought anybody from the dark to the light through apologetics. I might have opened the door and broken some barriers. There is no better evidence to the power and the testimony of Jesus than your changed life, your changed life and transformation. And so in verse 20, so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Now stay with me in this story. It's so good. If you just stay with me. For me, this prompts three important questions and they're quick. And I want you to ask yourself these three simple questions, okay? Number one, do you even have a story to tell? Has Jesus made such a transformation in your life that your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, and everybody knows Do you have a story? This man lived in tombs. People weren't strong enough to subdue him. He would cry out at the moon and cut himself. Can you imagine seeing him the next day after Jesus had healed him? And now his face is straight. He's calm. He's happy. He's free. Can you imagine people saying, what happened to you? What would he say? I'll tell you what happened to me. Jesus happened to me. This is it. This is it. 
let me just have one of those real honest, transparent, authentic moments with you. You cannot manipulate or coerce people. Because you hear a message like this, and the tendency is, great, another sermon to feel guilt. I don't even know how to tell my story, and I don't even know if I have one. The reason is, is because pastors and preachers can't manipulate and coerce you into doing something. We only do something when we've had this internal transformation and it becomes a natural byproduct of something else. My job as a preacher is to bring Jesus to you in such a way that I would hope that you would want to be with him. And as you pursue him and you're with him, he's actually the one that will change your heart, not me. So as I get older, I'm learning more and more. My job, just bring Jesus to you. Just just bring Jesus to you. My job is not to convert any of you. My job is not to make you something different than you are. My job is to give you Jesus. And if I can give you Jesus and you say, man, I want to pursue that guy, then Jesus will do all the work and the byproduct of your life will be authenticity and generosity and telling your story. But if I tell you to tell a story and you don't have one, you just feel guilty. And the only way you're going to get a story is by spending time with him. And you go to him and you say, I want to know you in the way you seek to be known. When you have those services on Easter, when all those people get baptized, do you realize what you're saying in your baptism? You're saying, I'm giving Jesus permission to change me from the inside out. I'm saying, Jesus, please happen to me. And when Jesus happens to you, you'll have a story to tell. You're saying, Jesus, I give you permission to change me from the inside out. Please happen to me. Some of you in this room have great stories to tell. If God's mercies are new every day, so is his writing his story on your life. If you're spending time with Jesus, there's something he's doing at every moment of every day of every season of life. And you've got a story. It's just natural. You just tell, here's what God is doing in my life. Jesus knows the best way to go to the other side and change it. It's not through some spiritual tract. Just tell people your story and what Jesus is doing in your life. Do you have one? And if you don't, it's because maybe there's no pursuit of Jesus in your life. There's no time you're spending with him. And if you don't spend time with him, how can he transform you? How can he change you? I can tell you this. I've been married 20 some years and my wife changes me every day. I'm being transformed. You spend time The second question is, where is your other side? Is it your workplace, those demon-possessed, bad language, dropping, porn-addicted, irreligious people? Your neighborhood, your school, your family? Where's your other side? Where is your circle of influence? And are you telling your story? Jesus has the oddest strategy for how he plans on infiltrating and reaching the other side. He transforms us, and then even though we're tempted to join a holy huddle and to hide... He keeps prodding us out of the holy huddle, even though the holy huddle is good. Discipleship has to happen somewhere. But he keeps prodding us out and saying, I'm going to turn you loose, son. I'm going to turn you loose. Just tell your story. He just needs one fired up, spirit-filled, transformed life that will tell his or her story. Do you have a story? Where is my other side? And finally, am I all in for the other side? There's always going to be a temptation in your life to avoid this because it's hard. Going over to the Decapolis is hard. Meaning a demon-possessed person, that's hard. And Jesus, no, you're always going to be tempted to avoid it or somehow to think you're better than the other side. But he reminds us in Luke 18 that what is impossible with man is possible with God. Will you be all in? Would everybody right here, would everyone make the commitment? And you, you, you would say, I am going to tell my story in my circles of influence, wherever God sends me, I'm going to tell what Jesus is doing. Yes, it might be about your conversion when you first met him, but it also might be about what Jesus is doing right now in your life through your pain. It might be what he's doing right now in your life through your family, through the tragedies of your life, through the challenges of your life. That's why if we're only a people that are happy when everything's going well, we have no story to tell. We're supposed to have joy that is central. Sorrow is only supposed to be peripheral. Because no matter what's going on in our lives, we know Jesus, his power is upon us and he's always working in us and through us. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. God does his best work when you're in pain. You will never know Jesus the way he seeks to be known until you're in pain. Because only then will you cry out, call out, and you'll begin to experience who he really is. Not in theory, but in practice. Do you have a story? Are you telling your story? Are you all in with your story? Imagine these guys, when they returned and saw these huge crowds, 
Can you imagine? One guy greets him the first time. Second time, 4,000 people ready to hear a sermon. And they're greeted again by this demon-possessed dude. Only this time he's not demon-possessed, this crazy-eyed dude. He's been set free. I can just see him down on the shore. We've been waiting. Heard you were coming. Few people want to see you. 4,000 come to Jesus. And I can imagine Jesus putting his hand on this kid and saying, ah, son, last time I came here, they begged me to leave. But now these people are wide open to the kingdom because of you. Thousands of people have come to hear the good news. What happened? And that former demon possessed guy says with a great look of determination, a definitive resolve, he says, I did it. I just kept telling people what Jesus did for me, how he transformed me and freed me. Nothing or no one could stop me. And the more you tell it, the more your faith grows. And that's why Jesus said, as his very last words, go into all the world, do what? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Now, please stay with me. When you are baptized, that is the point in my understanding that you give Jesus the permission to write a new story into your life. The whole analogy is that you are dying to your old way and being resurrected to a new. Now, salvation comes through faith alone. I understand. But when you step into the waters of baptism, here's what you're saying. And Paul was clear about this in Romans 6. You're saying, okay, Jesus, I know I'm saved by grace through faith. I get it. I am now, I am giving you total and full permission to write a new story into my life. I am dying to the old me and I'm being raised to the new me. And I'm saying to you, Jesus... I want you to turn me loose. Write a story into my life that I can tell the world. However you decide to write it, whatever experiences you decide to bring, I hereby declare before you and before my friends and before the world that I have died to my old way where it's all about me and egocentrism to theocentrism. It is all about God. It is all about you. Now, God, write your story on my life. Write your story. And as you write my story, I'll give the commitment And it's a covenant you make with God. As you write the story, a new life into my life, I will go and I will speak and I will go to the other side and I will go to this side because all sides are your sides. If there's anybody here that says, I want to write a new story, I want him to write a new story in my life that you would come and we would receive you. Are you ready? All right, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name for what is about to happen. I pray that there's even one person, even people listening online who may need instruction I pray that they would make a decision for you now. I pray that all of us would say, I'm going to tell my story at work, in my neighborhood. I'm go- I, gotta- I know you're doing amazing things in my life. I'm going to tell my story. That they would get the gumption and the intestinal fortitude empowered by the spirit and the wisdom of the spirit to go and tell their story. And for those who have not yet been baptized and obeyed you in a most fundamental command, And giving you permission, God, write your new story and new life into me. That they would come. They would come now. That they would recognize that the doubt that they have does not come from the spirit, but comes from the evil one. The one who does not like such a covenant and commitment. I pray that you'd overwhelm them with your love, with your kindness, with your conviction. That today is the day. I pray for those who might have come from a tradition where maybe they were baptized as babies. I pray that somehow through the teaching of scripture, although no one is challenging their salvation, we are simply saying that in the book of Acts it is a decision made as an adult. When you are at the age of accountability, that you're able to know you're a sinner and you're able to come forward and say, Jesus, write a new life into mine. Something that cannot be done for us by our mom or dad, but something that we must do ourselves. And I pray for the spirit and that new lives would begin, new stories would be written, and thousands would come because one at a time told the story of transformation. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me wanna dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will bring this offering You are my wonder, you bring the wonder 
Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.